Hello everyone. So as you say, Nordic Satsata, I'm Kotin Narasim, and what it is, Joe. I'm Shane Doddridge, and I work for the Chilcotin National Government in the Maui Department. We're represented here today, and there's four of us. So, thank you again. It's really an honor to be able to speak to you guys. Mapping is my passion, and and this is a really interesting topic. And so far, a lot of the presentations, Chris's and um, Frank's and Karen's, were all really kind of everything sort of coming together. So I want to talk about names. So. On May 8, 2018, six Chilcotin names were adopted. These are the community names on the left here. And then on April 4th, 2019, another 12 names, uh, mountains, lakes, rivers, were adopted by the province in recognition that they were their first. The territory itself, Nahuanan, means our land. Um, the homelands are located between basically the Fraser River and the Coast Mountains. It's a very big area, um, and it can get political, and I'm going to try and not be political today. Mm -hmm. um, so here's the six communities that make up the nation, and part of um, part of those the nation are two other communities as well that are not represented by the tribal council itself. <coughs> so the Chilcotin people, um, there's about 5,000, um, and there are plenty of activities, cultural activities that take place on the land, and they literally take the place. So you can see in each of these photos, there's a place name associated with the activity happening in that area. Hunting, fishing, gathering, preserving, trapping, ranching and hanging, capturing and taming wild horses. Rodeos, really important. <laughs> All kinds of cultural games, competitions, <laughs> drumming and singing and other cultural activities, just to name a few. So those names are imbued on the landscape. The landscape of the Chilcotin has some of the biggest lakes, some of the tallest peaks, some of the coldest rivers in the province, and it's a really amazing place to be. The relationship with the land is deep, as is with most indigenous groups around the world. Um, but we're talking about more than just places. We're talking about how, how a culture through language is a part of the landscape. And it's not just about the names of places, but it's about how those places are interconnected and how those places are have a unique name. And that name can be represented by what's there. Um, it can be represented by a mythological figure or a historical figure, and those names, like, they're variable. Um, and I want to talk about this name in particular, <coughs> just to start anyway. So, Tylos, uh, before he was a mountain, he was a man, and he had a wife and you, and um, they decided to separate. They had a few kids together, but times got tough, and they decided they would separate, uh, and you went west and across the potato mountains she sprinkled the seeds for wild mountain potatoes and that's where they're still gathered at today. So I stayed where he was um, and any then crossed Tetrakopi, Talioko Lake and eventually started to second guess her choice to leave her husband and as she turned around she turned to stone. She became a mountain. But she didn't just become a mountain. Silas also became a mountain and so did their kids. And so this story tells us about moving forward in life and how when you make a really hard decision, you shouldn't look back, you should look forward. And if you don't, if you do look back, you turn to stone, you get stuck, and so do your loved ones. So the colonial name for that mountain is Mount Talo, and this is his story. He was born in Ireland in 1855, he joined the militia in Victoria, when he was 24, he unsuccessfully ran for the BC Legislative Assembly twice in 1898 and 1894. He was finally elected in 1900. He was minister with a few different hats. His, probably his most impressive feat was to introduce legislation that required all immigrants to BC speak and read and write in a European language. It doesn't matter what, as long as it's European. Um, and then he resigned in 1909. He was thrown from his carriage from an 
Carson was killed, um, as far as I can tell. I mean, he looks like Jean Luc Picard, but other than that, <laughs> as far as I can tell, he never left the Lower Mainland. He never vis visited Talos. He never saw the mountain or even entered the territory. So why does it matter what name goes on that mountain? That's really what this is all about. Why should we? Why should we care what name a place has? The Chilcotin name in this case has been in use for hundreds if not thousands of years already and it's still in use today. It teaches a lesson that is relevant to all of us. It's our shared humanity. The place name at Chilcotin is a link to their ancestral homelands. It's a connection that's much deeper than we might understand. Our colonial names that we attach to places don't have that same connection outside of Europe if you're European. And yeah, like I said, the, the name is still in use today. Every child in the Chilcotin learns this story. Everybody who visits hears the story. You don't point at Silos. You know, there's some tradition around it. And nobody knows who Robert Tallow was. Raise your hands who knew about it. <laughs> nah. So here are the questions. Why should we, why should we adopt, uh, in this case, Chilcotin place names? Why should the province, we as a province, adopt these names as official. And from my recollection, I would assume that there are these three fairly major ways. Number one, the depth, they're much deeper, they're much more meaningful, they hold more value than the colonial names. Uh, they're more accurate, they're more descriptive, uh, and they're a better representation of the landscape in general. Um, and the use of the name is still ongoing. It, it's been uninterrupted. And that's how, as my colleagues and I know, um, these, these names are, are everywhere and everybody still uses them. So we already talked a little bit about depth and why one name might be a little bit deeper and more meaningful than another. But I wanted to talk a little bit about accuracy as well. So this is a screenshot I took from last week of Google Maps, basically as far out as you can get to see most of the Chilcotin region of BC. These are the names that are on the map and although we have uh, adopted the six community names and traditional names, they are still not adopted by Google. So Google needs to do an update of their gazetted names. But what we can also see is that representation demographically is off. So all these places in the Chilcotin, some of them have a scattered farming population of no more than 20 or 50 people. Some of them, maybe there's 100 people. But the neighboring First Nation communities have hundreds, if not, in Anaheim's case, 550 people. It's very substantial compared to Alexis Creek. You can't buy gas in Alexis Creek, but you can buy gas in Anaheim. So it's, Google doesn't know that. It's a problem for travelers, right? But there's also descriptive accuracy. So here's another example. This is Niagara Platt, Farwell Canyon. So who here knew about Arthur Stanhope Farwell? He was a surveyor, and he was surveyor general for a period of time. Um, and he worked out of Victoria and Nelson. As far as I can tell, he also never visited the territory. In Chilcotin, the name is Nagmatlet, the place of many landslides. And through this animation, you can kind of see why. So when there's a landslide, the river floods, and this is a major fishing site. And if the, land, if the landslide's gonna take place, the river's gonna flood, it's a danger, people need to know about it. So that's why they call it that. It's a descriptive name. So a third point is about use, and so uninterrupted use, use is fairly straightforward. People are still using these names today. And the name changes and varies between families and between people, and sometimes there's two names for one place. Sometimes there's three or four different ways of spelling or pronouncing a name, but it's still being used. And then anglicization, we heard from other presenters today about anglicized names. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about that. So in most cases, the Chilcotin region was, uh, <coughs> the fur traders came there first, and then settlers came in later, and then there's the Chilcotin War, and that's a whole other presentation, but um, a lot of the names that were used for the names of lakes and rivers, mountains, were the Chilcotin names anglicized by people with the best of their abilities. So in this case, Kani Bean, Kani Lake, Bean meaning lake, Kani Lake, Kani, Kani. So that's an anglicization. And here's another example. So benzene is the Chilcotin name for this lake. 
Punzi is the name that we use today. Benzi Punzi. It's similar, but here's the story of how that happened. So in 1861, Lieutenant Palmer was commissioned to find a trail from Bentic Arms in Bella Coola, um, not following Mackenzie's trail, but a new trail to Fort Alexandria. He wrote on his map Punzi with two E's. This map was from during the Chilcotin War when the militia wanted to find out better where some of the Chilcotin warriors were hiding. And so they spoke with some Chilcotin people, chiefs in fact, and Ben Shi was one of the names that came out of that. So when you're actually sitting down and listening to the sound of a name, you might get a little bit closer. Ben Shi, Ben Zin, it's a little bit closer. <clears throat> and again on Waddington's map in 1868, a pretty famous map, um, he says Ben Chi. So again, not too far off. Launders and Mohan, Mohan in the 1870s and 1880s revert back to Palmer's spelling and then the name that was officially adopted, well here we can see it was 1923, Punsi with an I, it was officially adopted into the gazetted names of BC in the 1940s. But today we still see, here's another screenshot from last week, Punsi Lake with an I. So it's still an anglicized name, it's still a Chilcotin name, and it's somehow proof of ownership, proof of use, pre-contact. So the meat and potatoes of this is all about ethnographic mapping. And these are kind of the four processes that we go through to get a name recognized by the government. So first we have to weed through old data, and there's a lot of it. Spatial, non-spatial, there's tons. And then we have to fill in the gaps. So where we find we don't have names, <coughs> It's almost impossible that there wasn't a name. So we talk to elders, we find out, we research, we look into it. Um, and then after that, we try and compile all that information together um, to find out what the right spelling pronunciation is <coughs> going to be for each name. And then we submit to BC. Before we go further on that, um, just a couple of notes on the language itself. Nikhani Chik um, is the name of the language. Uh, and here's a map from Wikipedia. It's actually the guy that does these maps on Wikipedia. They're pretty good and pretty well researched. Um, so these, this is a map of the Nadine language family, also known as Athabascan. Or I'm not a linguist, so it's I'm sure it's similar. And the Chilcotin is this southernmost wing of the upper arm of the Athabascan languages. Not always down in the south, but there, it's interesting how people might have migrated maybe along the coast to make this language spread throughout North America. So the language has been spoken for a long time, but it was only really codified into an orthography starting in 1968. Um, Quindell King's first initial attempt at building an orthography was very basic. Cross and Latimer through the 70s continued on with that, but it wasn't until Ed Cook uh, started actually working with elders uh, and language experts from the nation to actually learn a little bit more about how the structure of the language is. <coughs> and the orthography was more or less completed and adopted by the nation at that time. And it's being taught in schools today. So yeah, just to highlight that it's a brand new written language. So the way the language is spoken has been around for a long time, but the writing system is new and that presents some challenges. One last note on dialect and spelling. So um, there are basically two dialects in the Chilcotin language, one with nasalized vowels and tone. Uh, there's compound words um, and the pronunciational changes as well, but the nasalization is the main difference between dialects. Different regions and different families within regions might pronounce the language in different ways. And another thing to note is that new learners of the language for the past, basically anyone under 40, um, drops tone and drops nasalization. And that's kind of a reflection linguistically of how languages tend to get simpler as new people are speaking it when you're not completely surrounded by it all the time. So based on this, there are two rules of thumb that the elders talk about. Uh, one is that if there is an alternate pronunciation, it requires an alternate spelling. So when you're transcribing someone's words, you transcribe it in a way that reflects the way it was said. So it's having respect for a bit of diversity in, in dialect. And the other one is that when you're going to put a name on the map, you want to choose the name that the community whose caretaker area the name is within is reflected on the map and not maybe necessarily something from the other side. So we weeded through a lot of old data and thanks to Leona, our practical student from BCRT, we were able to throw some numbers together. 
2,500 names we have documented. Um, and that rounds out too after you know you account for duplicates, we estimate around 1,000 place names. Data collection, so when we, when we do have gaps, we do one-on-one -on -one interviews or other discussions. We have group discussions and we go out on the land into the field. When we want to research a name, we do it in a few different ways. We start by cross-referencing the data, we conduct new interviews if necessary, we review with the language ex experts to make sure spelling and pronunciation is accurate, then we do a round of community engagement across six communities, we bring it back for final review with the language experts and the communities, and then we submit to BC. So the submission process to BC, through our agreement, um, we prepare it, so we take a chunk out of our master data set of the names that we want to review. Um, these are the ones that have already been cross-referenced and reviewed. Um, we add fields for relative location and other things. We use a clarification polygon to denote whether or not the name is a one-to-one -one with the colonial name or not, and in many cases it's not. We include fo uh, photos and audio files when we can, and then we send the name in to Heritage Branch. So this is the result. Uh, as of today, we've submitted about 60 names, <coughs> and there's probably another couple hundred that we can submit, and we're working towards submitting, but the province is really slow on, on the uptake. There's only one and a half people working on this for all of, all of DC, so it takes a long time. But here are the two highlighted here, the two examples I spoke about today. And so now this is what it looks like if you go on the Geographical Names website. You see the name with the correct orthography at the top, and we kind of kept pushing BC, you know, you need to use our diacritical markings on the caps on the S's and the glottal stops, things like that, because it's not, it's not the name if it's not spelled correctly. So, and then we have, this is what they used before, was just a JPEG of the name in case people wanted to see it, but we've, we've got them to use Unicode, which is, I mean, since the 1980s. <laughs> and then we get a chance down here to add some origin notes and some stories and so forth. So really what I'm hoping is you guys can think about, and we've been thinking about today with some of the other presentations, what kind of a map of Canada do we want to see? And so that's kind of up to us. So thank you to everyone, to the elders um, and other uh, colleagues, those that have helped me learn a bit of the language and try to understand some of the culture. Any questions? We've got time for questions. We do have time for a couple of questions. And a question mark like said, what's the glottal stop? No. The glottal stop will come down and there's no space between the bottom and the point. Right. The, the question mark or the seven is used as a glottal stop as well. Okay. It's a linguistic marker. Yeah, and what, how does it affect the way that it's said? It's the absence of a sound. It's when you close your throat. Like when you say, uh-oh, it's the between the uh and the okay. o. Okay. I'm so curious. <laughs> That's great. Sorry, does the oh, uh, <laughs> does the uh, provincial government have um, this name site have a pronunciation guide? Well, actually, we include in our submission we include in our submission a bit of a pronunciation, um, kind of a phonetic way to pronounce, right. so that we can at least get close. Because there are some sounds in that language that are not in English, so we can get close. It's a shame they don't allow. Um, so, uh, uh, sound file. They do. Oh, yeah. they do. They awesome. do. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. I think we can have one more question, shorter one. Yeah. Uh, this uh, economy research does it help establish path boundaries of territory? We like to think so. Yes. And what a lot of the elders would say is that. Um, when we have a name for it, and it, it's implicit of some degree of maybe not ownership, but definitely use. And in many cases, um, well, through the court case, the Central University's um, BC court case, that the nation won, uh, place names were a big part of that for the data collection process. If I could just supplement it, so that as you're doing this research, there's sort of a clear or a fuzzy boundary between <coughs> your place names and unknown names. <coughs> Um, it, it's really it's really dependent on the part of the region. Um, some some parts of the territory uh, we're missing names for. Like this area here, we're missing names for, and the reason for that is because the Hulkatchel community was moved south to what we call Negwinkun, 
um, and they're a carrier community, so now it's a mixed community, and they're not part of our tribal council. So we don't have as easy access to learn about the language from those communities. And so that's a political issue. Um, other issues, smallpox, hit this area really hard. So, and it hit this area really hard as well. So it's hard to always know, because there are some gaps. Um, but the names exist, we just don't necessarily, they might be going forever. Okay, thank you very much.